a way to honor the fallen officer and a constant reminder that this is unfortunately a reality for somebody that's in our line of work. This is something historic because for the first time ever in 2023 and in CBU history, we're seeing a Latino student union created by the students for the students. Passing it over to your men's soccer team, they had a great season ranking number five in the WAC conference with an overall record of 11, seven and three. Take advantage of every opportunity here. Get involved in everything that you are interested in and even try some things that you're not interested in. Jooms, lighting, it's almost every element of the fine arts put together in one production. From the campus of California Baptist University in Riverside, California, with Johai Hauregi and VNA Gonzalez Salgado. This is CBU TV. Hello and welcome to CBU TV's 2023 February news program. In our top story, 234 officers died in the line of duty last year. This year, two officers were killed in the county of Riverside, according to the website Officer Down Memorial Fund page. Reporter Wyatt Malcolm Murray with more. After yet another Riverside County Sheriff officer has been killed in the line of duty, Questions surrounding the workplace tragedy have prompted on how grief-stricken officers and staff get the assistance they need. Assistant Director of Safety Services Chris Dinko was able to tell us more. Law enforcement is a 24-hour-a-day operation. We go all through the night. Uh, even the next day after critical incident, we have to put out a patrol shift, handle calls, respond. So it's critical that the officers get some, some care, have somebody to talk to. We do have an employee assistance program and a counseling team that get dispatched for our clinical psychologists and counselors that can help officers deal with that grief. But we also have peer support programs because when these things happen, they happen and, and they affect a lot of people. They touch a lot of people at the same time. So uh, the counselors uh, can get overwhelmed with the, not, the amount of officers that need counseling, that need support as they grieve through the, the, go through that grieving process. So peer support teams in law enforcement are very common. And you'll see that from department to department. Sometimes departments join together to offer those services together in the network. Do you think officers in the line of duty handle grief of losing someone in the line of duty the same way as everyone else does? Or does it really depend on the individual? I would say, yeah. I, I think that it's, it's based on the individual and it's based on how close they were to the incident. I know that for Ryan's incident, my it was a hardened affair, I'll tell you, because I was the dispatcher on the radio, my stepmom was his sergeant, my dad planned his funeral. So our family was very closely connected to that. And all of us took it differently because of how close we were to it or how close we were to the incident, but not necessarily to Ryan himself. So if you're super close with someone and you lose them, you may take it a little bit differently than someone who didn't know them at all, but they're still a brother or sister in blue, and we still grieve that. So your grief process is, is different. I think for some people, they may take a little bit longer to kind of go through the grieving process and all of those steps that come with that. And then other people are hard chargers right from the start. It just depends on your personality and, and how, how you are mentally going through it. And there's no right or wrong way. How are officers usually remembered when they've been lost in the line of duty? Well, as a natural part of the grieving process, funerals are very well attended in the law enforcement community, along with the burial. So we go there to support each other. We know this is something that can happen at any time, but they're very well attended. Every year, um, we have a law enforcement officer's memorial ceremony here in Riverside County, um, right next to the Riverside Police Department station and next to Riverside County Sheriff's Department station. We have a memorial statue that recognizes every fallen officer that died in Riverside County throughout its history. Names are inscribed on that statue. We do our reading and a roll call of every officer that has fallen in the line of duty, and we recognize and honor the sacrifice that they provided. How do you guys keep that mentality of just staying strong and keep doing your job when you know there's somebody that's been lost in the line of duty? Sum it up, 
it's not hard, at least in my personal experience, to move forward. It's a way to honor the fallen officer and a constant reminder that this is unfortunately a reality for somebody that's in our line of work. And it reminds us that this is why we got into the field to begin with, right? We're there knowing the consequences and we're still gonna be doing our job for the community. So I wouldn't say it's in my in my opinion, it's not difficult to move forward. It gives me a sense of honoring that officer and remembering why I got into this position to begin with, in a sense. So it's motivating to do something, to feel like I'm doing something. Because when you lose somebody, and I, my chief has actually said this before, and it's so true, law enforcement officers have this tendency to want to fix things and to want to make it better. And when somebody in our, in our field passes, it, it affects all of us, obviously, because that's in one way, shape, or form our brother or sister that just had past doing the same thing that we do every day. So in a sense, it gives me a sense of um, honor and motivation to, to do something, because I can't change that, that that happened. So moving forward and going forward with everything gives me a sense of pride. Riverside police and sheriff officers have been through a lot of tragedy within the last month of January. We pray that they stay strong and continue the good work of protecting and serving our community. For CBU TV, I'm Wyatt McElmurray. In other news, CBU's Latino enrollment population is currently at 41% according to their institutional data for fall 2022. The recently formed Latino Student Union has made stride for Lancers to feel welcome and provide a community amongst one another. Reporter Noemi Solorzano gives us more insight. Y eso era la, la mayor necesidad de crear un grupo donde los estudiantes se sienten uh, apoyados, comprendidos. Dr. Noemi Hernandez Alexander, a mother, educator, and professor of political science here at CBU, is now dedicating her efforts to encouraging Latino students all throughout campus through a new club, a first of its kind. Este año 22-23, this is something historic because for the first time ever in 2023 and in CBU history, we're seeing a Latino student union created by the students for the students. Latino Student Union, or LSU, has emerged as a sort of cultural capital on campus grounds where many can unite and celebrate culture and encourage one another in their educational journey. Progressively over the past 10 years, what we've really seen is a steep incline in the number of Latino students coming to study here at CBU. LSU is not only opening its doors to celebrating culture, but also serving its members. Throughout the semester, they're encouraging students to apply from internships, jobs, to even mental health resources. Kimberly Roman, a first generation student and president of LSU, found motivation in isolation. Her mission? to help other Latinos like her find a voice. It was really hard creating connections with others on campus, and LSU has given me the opportunity to meet new people and be in community with one another. LSU aims to understand and support first-generation students. Dr. Noemi has first-hand experience with the struggles that come with being first-gen. That pressure is real, and these students need someone to understand them. And that is why LSU has made a great effort to continuously meet, so that students can know that they are not alone and that we are in this together. As a first of its kind, LSU hopes to continue building communities and also build connections. For CBU TV, Noemi Solorzano. Thank you, Noemi. To find out more information about LSU, visit their Instagram account at CBU Latino Student Union. We turn the spotlight to CBU Homecoming Weekend, where alumni get the chance to relive their college student days and rekindle relationships. Reporter Vianney Gonzalez was at the event to get the inside scoop. This year, California Baptist University invites classes 2013, 1998, and 1973 to celebrate their 10th, 25th, and 50 year reunion at the Homecoming Carnival. What was your major and how has your career experience been? Uh, my major was uh, elementary ed. I wanted to be a teacher and I finished 
40 years in elementary or in the school system and it's been fantastic. My major was psychology and music. It was Brenda Stark. My experience at CBU was amazing. It was, we were the first class with Dr. Ellis. So it was awesome to see when he brought vision and purpose into the university. Do you have any words of wisdom for CBU students? Take advantage of every opportunity here. Get involved in everything that you are interested in and even try some things that you're not interested in. Enjoy your time in college because it goes by super fast. If you're here, that means you value education. And with an education, your opportunities for you are endless. I will share, live your purpose, right? That's the school motto, live your purpose and know that when you're here, you're full of people that actually care about you. I will pray with you, that will uplift you and that want to see the best in you and want you to excel in your career and in the body of Christ. So, amen. For CBU TV, I'm VNA Gonzalez Salgado. Thank you, VNA, for showing us the value of our time at CBU through the eyes of alumni. In the world of sports, CBU had an epic season this past fall with many outstanding victories and some heartbreaking losses. Here's reporter Brett Rosen with the Fall Sports Recap. What is up, Lancer Nation? It is Brett Rosen for CBTV, and Fall 2022 came with many ups and downs for our athletics programs. To recap all these ups and downs, here is the Fall 2022 Sports Recap. Moving over to the pitch, both the men's and women's soccer teams got a long-awaited stadium during the fall semester. The stadium could hold 500 spectators in the stands and well over 1,000 alongside the grass field. The stadium design successfully held the most attendance during the WAC championship with 651 spectators. The new stadium facilitated women's soccer with a great deal of success, ranking 8-5-5 five and, five, and a conference record of 5-3-3, three three, with notable wins against GCU scoring 3-1 and against Seattle U with a score of 1-0. However, they did lose in a nail-biter game in the WAC tournament to New Mexico State in double overtime with a score of 0-1. Passing it over to your men's soccer team, they had a great season ranking number 5 in the WAC conference with an overall record of 11-7-3 and an in-conference record of 4-3-2. And, and as the 5th seed, they beat the number 4, number 1, and number 2 seed to win the WAC tournament and for the first time ever becoming WAC champion. Your women's volleyball team, who had a very middle of the pack season, ranking number seventh in the WAC conference with a 12 and 14 overall record and a conference record of seven and seven. They had notable wins against in-conference rivals, Utah Valley and Seattle U, but they also lost to other in-conference rivals in the first round of the WAC tournament against number two ranked team, Stephen F. Austin. The team had some standout players with a bright spot being Christina Graff, who had made it in all WAC first team. Now, swimming over to men's water polo, they started off the season ranked number 13th in the collegiate water polo ASSN NCAA top 20 pool. It was also announced that the men's water polo team would move to the WCC conference with other notable schools like Pepperdine University and San Diego University. Their overall record was well above 500. However, with a record of 23 and 13, they did not do as well in conference play with a conference record of four and four. Even though the men's water polo team did not do as well as some might have hoped, they had a very good overall record with some notable match wins against Brown University, which are number 19th ranked, and against number 14 ranked, Harvard University with a score of 14 to 10. Your men's and women's cross country team, to say they had a great season is an understatement. Both teams won the WAC championship with the men's team going back to back. Both the men's and women's teams had eight runners who were all WAC first team and five that were all WAC second team. Well, that's everything CBU Sports Fall 2022. It was a semester filled with hardships and great success. For CBTV, I am Brett Rosen. Thank you, Brett, and congratulations to the men's soccer for being WAC champions for the first time. The opera program put on its second production, Romeo and Juliet, and revives a much-neglected art form. Reporter Via Hagen with the details. CBU's opera, Romeo and Juliet, marks the second production for the opera. We speak to the director, Jean Moon, and students Jordan Sparks and Sam Garcia to talk about what they hope to see from the production and how this impacts the future. The operatic arts are one of the most collaborative arts that we have in musical culture. We have drama, acting, singing, instrumental music in the pit, stagecraft, set designer and a builder, costumes, lighting. It's almost 
every element of the fine arts put together into one production. Romeo and Juliet, uh, I think a lot of people know the story, but more so than the story, I think it's important for people to experience something like opera. You don't get to do that a lot anymore, and it's few and far, and when you do, the tickets are normally astronomically expensive. It's the original story. Tragedy, love, feuding families. I mean, when you think about it, whatever we see in real time, what do you call it? Reality TV today, we owe to Romeo and Juliet. <laughs> Whether it's living with the Kardashians or whatever TV sitcom you don't watch, we have it because of that original tragedy. Um, I think seeing it in an opera format kind of adds um, a new layer to it and having the, having the music along with the storyline is really special um, and it's really fun to be part of. It was originally by Shakespeare, a theatrical stage play that the French composer Charles Gounod converted into or added music to create it as an opera. I came on here, they were kind of just starting the opera program and now I've graduated and this is our second opera production. And yeah, I think it's a great opportunity for people to learn about a dying art form and be able to keep doing it. Yeah, I'd love to see nothing more than this program to flourish, even in my absence. We've grown a lot since last year and the program has grown a lot. And I'm just excited for our audience to see all the hard work that we put into it. Um, and hopefully that it will show in our performance and people will like it. <laughs> we'll do one every year. Last year we did a, an opera entitled The Elixir of Love. And this year, of course, Romeo and Juliet. And we'll have one for next year and the years going forward. For information about future opera projects, contact the music department either on their website under Shelby and Fern Collinsworth School of Performing Arts or by stopping in the music building here on campus. This has been Via Hagen for CBU TV. Thank you, Via. The opera program plans to repeat a new performance annually. Thank you for watching the CBU TV February news program. Be sure to follow us on social media. Until next time, have a blessed day.